I want to welcome you all to the South Florida Poetry Journal's reading series. We're delighted to have two wonderful, amazing poets with us today. And um, before we begin, <clears throat> my name is Judy Ireland, and I curate the reading series for SoFlo Pojo. And I would also like to introduce uh, Michael McInomera, who is the managing editor and publisher of SoFlo Pojo, our fearless leader. Um, probably sooner, if soon, we will also be joined by Lenny De La Rocca, who is the founder and publisher of South Florida Poetry Journal. So um, with that, I would like to get going. Tonight, we are recording the event. However, when I do the recording, um, if we post it anywhere, it will have just the people who are reading their poetry. So you won't be on camera. And, um, but I will be able to collect the chat comments and pass them on to the poets after the event is finished. So if you would like to comment on what's being read or comment on anything, a question that you have, be sure to put it in the chat, which will be open for the entire reading time. Okay. So we'll start out tonight with uh, Linda Nemec Foster. She's the author of 12 collections of poetry, which is amazing, including Amber Necklace from Gdańsk, which was the finalist for the Ohio Book Award in Poetry, Talking Diamonds, a finalist for the Forward Magazine's Book of the Year, and The Lake Michigan Mermaid, which was a 2019 Michigan notable book. Her work has been published in magazines and journals such as the Georgia Review, Nimrod, Quarterly West, Witness, New American Writing, North American Review, Hard to Get Into, Patterson Literary Review, and Verse Daily. Foster's poems have also appeared in anthologies from the US and the UK, but they've been translated in Europe. They've inspired original music compositions and have been produced for the stage. Her first commission libretto, Spirit of the Lake, will have its world premiere in 2022. So I wanna hope that you keep us uh, posted on how we can see that, listen to that. She has received nominations for the Pushcart Prize and awards from the Arts Foundation of Michigan, ArtServe Michigan, National Writer's Voice, Dyer's Ives Foundation, the Poetry Center in New Jersey, and the Academy of American Poets. From 2003 until 2005, she served as the first Poet Laureate of Grand Rapids, Michigan. In the fall of 2019, she was the Poet in Residence at the University of Bielsko Biala in, in Poland. Her new book, The Blue Divide, was published in 2021 by New Issues Press. She's the founder of the Contemporary Writers Series at Aquinas College, and we are just delighted to have you here with us tonight, Linda. So please, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Judy, for that wonderful introduction. And Sandy, it's so wonderful to see you and to read with you. And to everyone around the world, Australia to Washington to uh, Manistee, and uh, Douglas, Michigan, thank you. Um, I am going to be reading uh, mostly poems from my new book, The Blue Divide, that was just published um, a few uh, months ago. And I will begin with a poem that was also published in South Florida Poetry Journal. So hats off to Lenny De La Rocca for um, uh, accepting this. And it is a um, poem inspired by the work of a Spanish artist. His name is Jaumia Plenza. Jaumia Plenza. And uh, he had an installation in Grand Rapids a number of years ago. And I was commissioned to write a poem um, about the exhibit. And this is it. It's called In the Mist of Dreams. And it's in three parts. In the Mist of Dreams, one disease. The father trapped in his body, disease of his mind, closing the door of his prison so tight, not even the idea of moonlight, faint light of his dreaming self can escape. He shuts his eyes, he memorizes the language of regret, and it brands his face like the lexicon of a sleepwalker. I should have planted the azaleas in the month of rain. I shouldn't have prayed so loud, to the silent face of God. Endless words that fill a small room with empty air. He imagines his feet and the places they have walked in the world, the gray shores of Normandy to the broken ridges of Montana. 
after all these landscapes, what shoes to wear at his funeral. The possibilities surround him like discarded souvenirs from a forgotten vacation. What can he do with the rest of his life but pretend he's a cloud? Dusk tinged stratus that marks his borderland, that marks his borderland, the abandoned horizon. Two, hunger. The Spanish mystic cannot satisfy his hunger. Locked in a cell in Toledo, he envisions God as a sharp wind, a burning ember, a vast mountain only the night can embrace. His hunger does not crave any simple gesture, bread and water once a day, but only the bread of angels, God himself. How would the divine taste on his tongue? The mystic closes his eyes and tries to imagine swallowing pure light. The radiance illuminating a path from his mouth to his heart, to his feet. Who needs shoes for such a journey? He remembers the ancient prophet removing his unholy sandals to approach the holy fire. Fire that burned but did not consume until it flamed that night in Toledo in the belly of the saint as he rehearsed the language of heaven. Three, insomnia. The man who cannot sleep has been here before, a room filled with memory and the faint sound of leaves as they cover the ground. In the waking world, he is an intruder, an interloper, as uneasy in his skin as the museum curator at Birkenau discussing the glass cases of shoes and hair. At night, he is reduced to reinventing every scenario of his life, from the opening credits to the quiet denouement. His eyes may not be open, but he remains forever awake and counting. Letters, not syllables. Words, not ideas. Phrases, not sentences. The people he has abandoned scatter, but not before they each leave their imprint. Fashionable leather boot, small sneaker, red and spiked heel, brown and scuffed loafer. Each one demands attention. Each one a different story he narrates in seamless detail to the patient and faceless moon. Uh, quite a few poems in the Blue Divide are based on visual art. They're aphrastic poems. And I think it's because I'm a frustrated visual artist. I never got beyond stick people, folks. Stick people and uh, a round thing for a sun. That was about it. So a number of the uh, poems are aphrastic poems in the Blue Divide. And this, um, this next sequence of poems is called The Artist's Notebook. It's a sequence in the book of uh, seven parts, but I'll only read a few of them uh, now, but they all stand alone as separate poems. So this is from the artist's notebook. How to paint an approaching storm. Pick a clear day while they still exist. Blue sky, yellow sun, the predictable boredom of a calm landscape. Blend in the anxiety of waiting. The cicadas suddenly hushed the hawk lost in its endless spiral. Keep mixing the afternoon in colors that are silent, gray of stone, black of the stone shadow, the palette of dusk arriving too soon. Close your eyes and count to 100, to your birthday, to the square root of memory, until the sky splits into a cro crooked river of light. Now stop. Feel the rain on your face as if for the first time, as if you have never been here before. This next poem is about the Italian Baroque artist Bernini. Great sculpture, great art, but I'll let you decide about his life. So this is called Backstory. 
And I uh, talk about his actual sculptures, his actual pieces of art in this uh, poem. Backstory. The open mouth of St. Teresa and her ecstasy. The death of blessed Ludovica and its mirage of light. Pluto's wide hand on the marble thigh of Proserpina and the tears that, that seem to stream down her cheek. All of this passion by Bernini can overwhelm any young tourist, but it's his Daphne and Apollo, the girl growing leaves and roots while the god is in hot pursuit that makes my daughter gasp better than Michelangelo. But she doesn't know Bernini's backstory, the jealous rage that made him force a servant to slash a woman's face until it wasn't a face. But why ruin the moment? No artist is perfect, even though the art can be. Consider his Teresa and her angel. The marble floats as if it's already in heaven. Art and life. Who can sculpt grief like Michelangelo? His writhing slaves, incomplete and still locked in their marble wombs, mirrored an agony only matched by his. He knew how to perfect it on the silent face of a perfect Madonna, mother and dead son. But imagine this other grief. At the moment when another woman's grown son died, not by crucifixion, but by cancer, she crawled into his hospital bed, held him, and sang lullabies until he was cold. What image embraces the deeper pain? The art enshrined in a large church or the private tableau hidden in a corner of suburbia? Our master of grief cannot answer, only asks another question from the silent marble growing from his hands. And I'll go on to some other poems about family, but this is the last poem about art from the Blue Divide. Gift, and um, this is dedicated to my dear friend, Jim Carcina, a fine artist in Michigan who passed uh, a little over a year ago. Gift. A year before my son met the woman he'd marry, you painted this landscape of rocks, water, and thin line of horizon the place consumed by a lake and its obsession with the idea of blue. The idea hugs the shore and won't let go, not for the stark branch insisting on its existence or the boulders losing their sense of decorum with wild layers of movement. Isn't that how love works? The spinning and falling, obsessing and wondering what happens next, the view from this high bluff can't predict the future, let alone the future of our children. Impossible to know from this height. All we can do is give the gift and tell them to hold on to each other, to that idea of blue. The expanse of the landscape that can't be contained in a single image, that's what you give them. From art to science, and I think I'm, I, was, I was always a frustrated astronomer because I didn't have the math brain to go on with it in the college, but my daughter did, and she double majored in physics and astronomy in, uh, in college. So uh, this is my attempt to understand all of that. So this is called the theory of everything. It's a physics concept. There's a lot of things in here about physics, but you don't have to worry about understanding it because I don't understand it. So it begins with a quote from a catalog. And this is a catalog from the teaching company. And they're talking about the theory of everything. And they say, quote, a vision of physical reality so at odds with our experience that it defies language. So here am I trying to write a poem with language about this. So here we go. The theory of everything. Einstein's theory of relativity can be stated in one concise sentence, but 
What is it? What noun placed next to what verb modified by what adverb holds the secret? I ask my daughter, the aspiring astrophysicist, to speak the sentence. And if not the concise sentence, then the undulating lines of pure thought that can describe the theory of everything. Her mother, who froze in high school geometry, cannot comprehend how tiny strings vibrating in a microscopic universe can hold everything together, from DNA's double helix to the silky translucence of a moth's wings to Bach's concerto for two violins. How it can all be reflected in 11 dimensions, 11 parallel universes wrapped in empty space, a dark energy of nothing. My one-dimensional brain boggles as my daughter explains, but the messy world of an atom's nucleus, the photons and quarks, the positrons and muons, the wimps and the Higgs boson all blur in my tired head. She describes a famous physicist lecture, and I can only imagine him at the podium with mismatched socks, dark blue of sky mistaken for dark black of night. No use searching my finite space for a unified theory when I could hardly recognize my own daughter as she lives more and more in her own universe and leaves my small world behind. The daughter who waxes and wanes like the moon, loves me and pulls away like the tides, listens to a rock group called the magnetic fields, sing about the unscientific mess of love, loses car keys, and forgets to turn off the stove when the primordial soup boils down to nothing. The daughter who as a child was lost in a Chicago museum filled with the physics of Magritte. And as a smaller child noticed the silica shimmering in a lake in Nova Scotia and deemed it diamonds. This woman who now peers at the stars in the night sky and sees the same brilliance. And in the morning, thinks the warm air of a January thaw is not fog, but the broken snow on fire. The woman who knows the textbook explanation yet wants to believe in the flames. The daughter who looks at me with my cosmology of tentative words, tentative silence, and tries to see the mother, the proof that experience does defy all language and everything. Everything is connected, whether we can dare to believe it or not. Just going to read a few more poems on family, then I'll end with uh, some uh, uh, newer work. Uh, I talked about my uh, daughter. So here's a poem about my mother. And my mother loved um, gossip magazines. It's all you need to know about her. She loved gossip mag magazines and she loved to clean the house. So you're gonna get this in the poem. I'm gonna talk about Windex. It's kind of, kind of like a precursor of Windex. It was old school stuff you'd put on a window and a mirror. It was either pink or white, but then you rubbed it and it made a, the, you know, your window shine. I also talk about Prussian bluing. It was a la laundry additive that you would put in your washing machine for white clothes, not, you know, dark clothes, but white clothes. And it would make them, believe it or not, this blue water would make them sparkling white. So uh, this is about my mom. Uh, it begins with a quote from Ava Gardner, when a reporter asked her, describe show business. And she said, quote, it's the kissiest business in the world. You have to keep kissing people, unquote, Ava Gardner. And the poem is called A Kiss is Just a Kiss. My mother, in her own words, didn't know much. But what she knew, she knew. How to darn a sock's hole until its universe imploded into a white dwarf of string theories. How to polish window wax into a mirror until it reflected a gaze more intense than Snow White's stepmother how to magically stir the cauldron of laundry to transform Prussian bluing into a pure white shirt. And then 
her encyclopedic knowledge of movie stars. She never called them actors or actresses, but stars, as in the heavens, the constellations, the Big Bang. Her lessons were taught by chain-smoking gossip columnists. She poured over their theses, illuminated in the pages of Confidential, The Lowdown, Hush, Hush, and Uncensored. My mother could tell you how Jean Harlow really died. It wasn't kidney failure, but she was poisoned by all that peroxide she used on her hair. How Greta Garbo brushed her teeth. She never used toothpaste, only salt how Joan Crawford plucked her eyebrows. She didn't, enough said. My mother loved the backstabbing of it, the kiss and tell of it, the guilty pleasure of it. And when she read this quote from Ingrid Bergman, a kiss is a lovely trick designed by nature to stop speech when words become superfluous. My mother with her blue hands and amps and husband almost believed it. Just a few more poems I'll read for you. Uh, this uh, uh, next one is um, also from the Blue Divide. And this will be the, the last one I read from the Blue Divide before I go on to a uh, uh, couple more newer poems. And this is, I talked about my daughter, my son, and that one art poem and my mother. So here's a, here's a poem about my father. On the first anniversary of his death, I dream of my father. I don't exactly dream of him, but his voice. I'm calling from Krakow on the last night of my trip. Dad, I speak in to the white phone. His voice on the other end sounds deep and hoarse, as if he has a bad cold or has been talking a lot. Yeah, he replies. I'm in Krakow, your mother city. Oh, really? How is the weather? Fine, it's been good. I want to tell him about this place he's never seen. The market square gleaming like afternoon light, no matter what time of day it is. The starling swooping like a black cloud in Grushka Street above the statues of the 12 apostles. Hearing my favorite Chopin nocturne played in the Bronorowski Palace by a young Japanese woman. She whiz, I could hear him say, a Japanese woman living in Krakow. How that nocturne reminded me of him, the long goodbye I never got to say. But I just talk about inconsequential stuff. The heat wave that turned into a soft rain last night. The ugly forum hotel finally boarded up and turned into a giant billboard for Polish beer, the one and only Zivietz. That's nice, he says. Well, I gotta go. I've been talking too much over here and I don't wanna lose my voice. Somewhere on the edge of the city, a strong wind embraces the birch trees, changing their green leaves to silver in the thin morning. I think I just have a few more minutes, Judy. Um, I'm going to read uh, just two more pieces. I want to bookend this uh, with a shout out to Lenny and Soflo Pojo because these next two pieces were also published uh, in the South Florida Poetry Journal. And they are two uh, prose poems from a new manuscript that I just completed called Bone Country. And all you need to know is all of them take place in other countries. It's not, um, uh, it's not America. Uh, I think there's even one about Australia, our friend from down under. But uh, so all these prose poems, about 90 pages of them are all about different other, I mean, other places in the world. So uh, this is called The Daughter Draws the Pines of Rome. The daughter who rarely talks to her mother sits in the Colosseum surrounded by the silence of the past. She likes the indifference of history, the cool reticence of the ancient marble that has witnessed so much pageantry and spectacle, spectacle, so much pain and blood, but still maintains its distance, a distance she doesn't have to bridge. From her vantage point, 
she could see a grove of Roman pines across from the amphitheater. The archway perfectly frames one particular tree, as if the monument's anonymous architect placed his building at this intersection of stone and air just to capture the tree for this woman in the distant 21st century. In turn, she tries to capture it on the empty page of her notebook. The pale white comes alive with her pen and ink sketch. The thin trunk, the symmetrical umbrella of dense branches. She draws the tree as an answer to the question she knows her mother will ask back home. And my last poem that I'm gonna read for you this evening, and thank you so much, all of you, for your attention, for joining us, joining Judy and uh, Sandra and me. And uh, this was actually just recently published in the South Florida Poetry Journal, and it's called Painted Toenails in Ukraine. The young girl who gives the American woman a pedicure in the town's most elite spa, doesn't know the difference between a foot or a knee. The woman doesn't want to embarrass the girl and her lack of English vocabulary, so she never corrects her. Other knee, other knee, other knee is the mantra the woman sporadically hears as the right foot and then the left is covered with green kelp from the Black Sea and massaged into her skin's oblivion. Other than the incorrect word, the girl is silent. A thin gold orthodox cross dangles from her neck as she daydreams about her lover's thigh. She paints the woman's toenails in such a hard, brilliant red that weeks later, no nail polish solvent can remove it. The woman will have to wait a year after the nails have totally grown out before every trace of the color is gone. The girl and her halting mantra, a silent echo. Linda, thank you so much. It was such a delight to read your poems and now to hear them be read by you in your voice. Um, what a gift you've given us tonight. So thank, thank you, you very, very much. Thank you so much. Thank you all. All right. Our next reader tonight uh, is Sandra Yanon. Her poems and book reviews have appeared in numerous print and online journals, including Plowshares, Poetry Ireland Review, Prairie Schooner, Beltway Poetry Quarterly, Sweet Swim Every Day, a Miami um, journal, Live Encounters, Impossible Archetype, and Lambda Literary Review. Her poem, Requiem for Orlando, appeared in Palsamos, LGBTQ Poets Respond to the Pulse nightclub shooting, a special online edition of Glass, a journal of poetry in August 2016. Salmon Poetry published her debut collection, Boats for Women in 2019, and will publish The Glass Studio in 2022, and it can't come soon enough. She's host of the Collectibles Reading Series for Headmistress Press, and she also currently hosts Cultivating Voices Live Poetry on Facebook via Zoom on Sundays. And last Sunday was the first time I attended Cultivating Voices Live, and it was fabulous. I got to watch on Facebook, and it was really fun. So without further ado, I'm going to turn over the floor to Sandra Yanone. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Judy. And of course, Linda, what a, what a range of work following a tremendous body of work that you have accomplished. And um, I just loved thinking about your reading as a theory of everything. I mean, just just terrific, all the places we got to travel. What an absolute um, treat to read and try to follow you. And of course, um, what I really love about these Zoom readings is I get to read 
in places that I might not be able to travel to to read in person. So of course tonight we're joining you from, as Elizabeth Bishop says, Florida, the state with the prettiest name. And what better reading series than this in my mouth? So flow, Pojo. I love. <laughs> I just like walked around all day today, just saying, slow flow, Pojo, like because <laughs> it just makes me tremendously happy. So again, thanks to Judy. Uh, and of course, being here with Linda, and of course, being here with all of you um, on this summer uh, summer evening in in Florida and late afternoon here in the Pacific Northwest, where I'm joining you from. And I thought what I'd do is read a series of poems from Boats for Women, and then some newer work that will appear in the Glass Studio, which I now think sadly is getting pushed to 2023, but that's okay. Can always use some time to revise a little more. Um, but anyway, um, all of these poems to me have a connection to summer and I've never really put them together this way. But I thought on, a, as one of my favorite, favorite folk singers who just passed away, Nancy, Nancy Griffith always uh, had an album called One Fine Summer Evening. I thought, what better thing to do on one fine summer evening than to read some poems about summer or about the, the different aspects of summer. Well, um, Boats for Women, uh, my debut collection from Salmon Poetry in Ireland is really about four things. The, this constellation of silence, disaster, desire and hope. And the book itself has a, a, a real string to the indifference of history, as Linda mentioned in, in one of her poems. And one of the central features, for those of you that know the book, is the Titanic disaster of 1912. So this poem um, is in that first section of the book um, and is one of the Titanic poems, but nevertheless, you'll see how it takes place in summer, even though the date of the title is in April. This is Providence, April 14th, 1998. When I call my parents to wish their marriage continued success, Hear the Connecticut shore breaking in the background. I am thinking also of the ship, hoping that maybe on this April 14th, the Titanic doesn't hit the iceberg, that Captain Smith for once heeds the warnings of ice and doesn't give in to speed, that the lookouts have binoculars, that the Californian doesn't put its radio to sleep 10 minutes before the first distress call. But my mother isn't thinking about her anniversary or the iceberg when I call. She is thinking about Providence when she says she has something she wants to ask me, thinking about Providence before and after I hang up the Providence of last summer's love now ringing in my ears and all that week before spent convincing my mother that she was just a friend. But I was nervous at dinner, couldn't eat. On the drive to Providence, I grew tired and had to stop at the scenic overlook in Mystic where in the dark I could just make out the shadows of the historic ships pressed against the night. In Providence, her plane was the last to land and late, pulling into its gate like the Carpathia arrived in New York alone and anticipated. I sat in the airport with my head in my hands, afraid of whomever might not deplane. But when I looked up, she stood before me, 
with her luggage in hand. And in the middle of the summer terminal, we held each other as survivors of what we did not yet know. Strange, strange summer poem um, about that summer of um, still holding back and yet coming out. And, um, and uh, I remember late that night after driving back from that airport, being, being on the beach with that, uh, with that woman. So it uh, really evokes the idea of summertime to me in New England. Well, here's a poem that takes us again. Um, I love to write poems that are um, steeped in other places, other rooms, um, in the voices of other people sometimes. And the second section of the book, Votes for Women, are a series of poems all in the voice of Bess Houdini, the, um, the partner in life and in performance of the famed magician Harry Houdini. And uh, I wrote this poem one summer uh, laying in a yard in a gunquit, Maine. And it was the first time I heard her voice come into my head. So this is Bess Houdini remembers night before the modern world. This is where we should have made love. My body flat against the back lawn of this summer house once visited, the grass green and cut like the nape of your neck after the barber's trim. I don't move except my eyes, which roam through neighborhoods of stars. Framed by pine trees, I can almost reach their needles glazing the night, but the porch light is just slight enough to fix me here. The whir of the washing machine escapes the screen doors and a telephone line strung taut like those velvet ropes in wax museums keeps you from this world. My body now, with the urge to make wingspans, a flash of divinity, children carved in snow. It's what we attribute to the split moment of a star we know to be dying or worse. And don't mourn, but gasp for the way it leaves us sexless. We should have died here. Well, moving along to um, the, the third, um, the fourth section of Boats for Women, I'm going to, I'm going to skip one of the sections and do a little more, um, a couple more of these summer, these poems that kind of took place in summer. And this one happens to take place over, uh, will feature a, a lunch that took place in summer. This is called Thin Objects. The order is not important. In retrospect, you can admit that the women who induced your dizziness, your shortness of breath, are now small trinkets you no longer deny you collect. They dangle from your wrist, dancing without partners. Sometimes one smacks hard between your skin and another solid object, a countertop, the car door, the bedpost. In the mornings, pinch, tiny bruises, flower, smart to the touch, but you never determine which one struck the tinny blow. The woman who lurks all night around the details of the first woman who asked to kiss you, who whispered into the first minutes of the new day, we can't ever talk about this again. The woman who wouldn't talk for months until the Friday afternoon you arranged to eat fish for a non-coastal lunch. And not even the woman before your body knew there could be women, 
who went to Italy, returned with a charm of the Pope, which at first glance you mistook for an Eisenhower dime blessed in a brown velvet box. She offered the alloy, then withdrew herself. They are all ornament now, shiny and smooth, like coins comforting your pockets, resting against places where you can feel your bones refuse. Well, I have had the great uh, fortune to spend time in Ireland because um, my publisher uh, is in Ireland, but before that I was really drawn to Ireland because of Titanic. It's where um, sh the ship was built as well as of her last port of call. And um, I, spent, uh, I spent one summer in 2016 that turned out to be a very auspicious um, summer uh, for a number of reasons. Um, but one of them is I met many poets that would lead me to salmon poetry. Um, this, is, this is a poem that kind of takes place with some of my longing of that summer and how the summer began and, and unfolded. It's called 37 Days of Homework. She says patience over a surprise transatlantic call on day 18. And I hear September or longer. She says, I'm ready to come home. And I ask, which one? The one she leaves me stupefied in for 37 days while she searches other countries for saints and frescoes and dying fathers. Or the one I dream of remaking upon her return. I say, I am here to myself sitting on the front porch under the tepid stars, sipping lemon tea laced with artesian honey. I say this to myself on day 30, as I am more than a little afraid to tell her that nowhere in this world where I've just traveled, Limerick, Kinsale, Cove, or Prague feels like home without her. And this house I return to in America alone bears all, all the proof. The windows need cleaning. The empty chair next to me sighs under the weeping willow. The temple bells do, do not clink their unusual glassy tunes. They say only when she returns will we let in zealous air songs. The grass will weep with gratitude for the feel of her feet. Every garden plant will bend to reach her son. The cat's fur stripes will stretch out in approval. And finally, next to her, on day 38, I will long to say, I feel at home. Thank you. Well, that same summer in 2016 um, also uh, struck a blow uh, to the state of Florida and also all across the world um, connected to LGBTQ rights um, when the shooting took place in Orlando, Florida, uh, in the Pulse nightclub. And because I'm um, reading uh, tonight virtually um, to folks in Florida and beyond, uh, but because of the connection to Florida, I thought it was really important to um, bring this Sestina to this reading. Um, and take us back to that summer five years ago now. Uh, I like to warn folks that this does take us into the nightclub and there, there are images of um, violence. So, so this is a Sestina Requiem for Orlando. 
I am struggling now to comprehend my pulse, how I still have one after all the opportunities I've had to die by my own hands with too many drinks downed in bars then driving while I waited to become my uncloseted self. And now I have nothing to do but pulse with crackling rage while I raise an empty glass, mourning the fact that you, Orlando, lost so many hearts, lips, and hands, all wanting to give back something to the other hearts that beat like hell on that dance floor before the clock struck one. You, alive. You raising your drinks to the glassy air. You raising your brown Orlando hands to the heavens in the heat of your last night at Pulse. And of course, you don't know this. Don't know that death is waiting around the corner like a drunk in a car as you wait for last call. Your early morning heart drums faster to keep perfect time with its perfect pulse as it moves closer to each body on the dance floor, to the one you will leave this world with tonight, with your hands locked tight, pressing each other's calloused palms, your glassy eyes looking forward to the next time you raise them like a glass. Clutch them in the grace of everything that the body waits to release when it releases itself from the tenuous grip of hands in the act. And doesn't your Orlando always resemble the heart, restless, resilient, eager to demonstrate how it is one with the divine, how it yearns to live from within its own pulse? And now I am pondering the woman who sat next to me, pulsing on my porch steps before we kissed, then shuffled our hearts back into the deck to hide in the shadows of the one true thing that I know I have been waiting to discover with another. And now all the broken drinking glasses resemble diamonds on the glass floor and a pair of smeared sunglasses rests on the floor of the massacre's aftermath inside and outside of Pulse. Orlando, the world will wake up Sunday morning with news of your hearts murdered. And in the fifth stanza, I've dropped a line in shock. My hands go cold from grief. I don't know if I can wait for the one who could be the one, while everyone in Orlando is one dance step away from their hearts shattering like blown glass floats that hands once held precious, waiting for love to pulse. Yes, pulse. And still, I have one. Thank you. Uh, I don't read that poem often, um, but uh, I choose pretty carefully. And as I said, um, being here virtually connected um, with some folks who are joining us from Florida with a journal that originates in Florida, it felt really important for me. So thank you so much for listening. Well, I'm going to read, um, I think I'm going to try to read two, two or three more. Um, and uh, we'll end on a little historical note. And we'll end on something delicious and happy, happier <laughs> uh, in summer. Well, I'm going to take you back now. As I said, I really love the indifference of history. I, and I love that phrase, Linda, the indifference of history. I love writing about historical subjects. and. Um, I'm, I'm kind of, I have a little penchant for um, some murderers. Uh, this one happens to be about a murder that took place in 1892 in Fall River, Massachusetts. And some of you may remember the 
alleged murderer from a jump rope song um, that that was actually I learned in researching for this poem the 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 song emerged actually from the children in the neighborhood in Fall River, Massachusetts after Lizzie Borden was brought into police custody. So Lizzie Borden took an ax and gave her mother 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41, was actually said by the children um, in that neighborhood after the murders. So it's not something that was created after. What a fascinating thing to think of the kids there in 1892, coming up with that rhyme that would endure all this time. Well, this is what I call a fractured sonnet that seems appropriate given, given um, all the hatchets that uh, were, are part of this poem, which in fact is called All the Hatchets. Borden Residence, Fall River, Massachusetts, August, 1892. The police, after I summoned for help, appeared to wait with me for a break in the case. In my parlor, they apologetically hounded and hounded me with insinuations as questions before the wounds on my father's face had time to cake dry. We all made mistakes that blistering August day. I remained a woman alone because no one saw me awake with a man. They believed in all the hatchets they'd found dismembered in my basement, evidence resounding that I took the blade to flesh multiple times downstairs and up. I could not debate their suppositions any more than my deflated muscles could release their powers to a blunt instrument. I ask what you might have accomplished in those implausible hours. With all the words in your mouth, a confession of gravel you wished to spit to the planked parlor floor, your creased forehead unveiling its worry in the mirror's glass. What would you do to ignite your innocence if from the couch in the other room your father's one good dead eye continued its duress? Well, I like to uh, remind folks that uh, in fact, Lizzie Borden was found innocent of that crime. Um, there's some incredible biographies um, about, the, about the murder. Um, and uh, if you're interested in learning more, uh, look and read about the history. <laughs> Well, I'm going to end, as I said, with a poem that I think is a little, hopefully a little more upbeat after all this murder, mayhem, and shipwreck uh, that I've shared with you this evening. Thank you so much. Um, I actually live right down the street from a blueberry farm. And I spend many, I've spent many um, an early morning or uh, early evening picking blueberries. It's one of my favorite things to do in summer. So I, so I leave you um, with a very good taste of blueberries uh, to all of you this evening. And this is my last poem called The Taste of Blueberries with thanks to Sweet Lit for um, publishing it um, uh, a, a couple of years ago. The Taste of Blueberries. Oh yes, it could have been another season of waking to the blueberries that swelled, ripened during the blue night, whole and full, when we did or didn't sleep, and when we could wake to rub our blurried eyes open and wash our hands clean of night and ripe for morning, and the ink of 
of the blueberries that could write something over and over again from the tips of our fingers if we chose to rise and walk to the fields. And even if we never spoke there while picking, and even if our fingers bleeding blue never touched, we would know why we were here picking blueberries together in early morning underneath the bird songs and roosters calls. And even if our lips never touched the taste of blueberries, they would be here too, with all of this wanting, wanting, all the same. And the longer we stayed silent and the heavier our buckets became full, we would know we were here for this. But this was not that summer of blueberries and neither was the last or the one before that. And I'm here choosing to pick blueberries by myself because the truth of what I'll never have this season or any other unless you arrive begging for blueberry stained kisses wakes me to these berries makes up for every year we'll never have and knowing that our lives were always meant for this this fruit still blooms delicious inside my buried mouth <laughs>